right, thanks for staying up later, everybody. I'm Chris Connolly in for Bob Costas. He'll be back soon, but for now, it's me, so enjoy yourselves, we hope. We got Ben Kingsley here today. Ben became an international film star in 1982 with his performance in Gandhi. Now, why was that movie just so darn popular? Well, the movie business joke was that Gandhi represented everything that everyone in Hollywood really wants to be. Thin, tan, and powerful. Well, since then, Kingsley, Kingsley has played mobsters and Nazi hunters, heroes and villains, a vice president of the United States, and an animated frog named Freddy all with grace, intelligence, and a notable lack of vanity. Well, coming up, you can check out his performance as a wizened chess master trying to groom one more protege for greatness in Searching for Bobby Fischer. And later on this year, he'll be on view in Steven Spielberg's Nazi drama, Schindler's List. Now, the night he won the Academy Award, allegedly, he partied till 2 in the morning and then had to wait 30 minutes for his car. When some fans started yelling, fame is fleeting, he whispered, well, a little fame is better than none. Well, let's welcome the famous Ben Kingsley. Hi, how are you? I'm well, thank you for coming. Thanks a lot. Thank you. See you. Sure. treated differently in Hollywood because you had played Gandhi? I mean, just yeah, because... Yeah, they, they didn't have a clue <laughs> what to do with me. <laughs> they, um, they spoke to me very earnestly <laughs> about my performance in Gandhi and what's it like being a vegetarian now? And, <laughs> and I thought, hang on, hang on, hang on. You know, this was a performance, folks. This is called acting. Some people looked quite shocked when I told them that, you know, I ate meat throughout the whole film. I, you know, I had the occasional cigarette. I drank a lot of Indian beer. You metabolize all these things. You take them in like rocket fuel. And out at the other end is performance. You can't give a performance like that on brown rice. <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> Is it all over if they arrest you now? Not if they arrest me or a thousand or ten thousand. It's not only generals who know how to plan campaigns. What if they don't arrest you? What if they don't react at all? Something for your notebook. The function of a civil resistor is to provoke response. And we will continue to provoke until they respond or they change the law. Mm -hmm. They are not in control. We are. No, they really didn't know what to do with me. And and whether or not I could actually walk and speak and talk if I was not wrapped up in two, you know, blankets or wearing a large pair of diapers, you know. <laughs> they, they weren't entirely sure that I could move without my diapers, you know. <laughs> but you got very good tables at restaurants. Should we and... potty train him first and then see how he goes? <laughs> you know? <laughs> the perfect introduction to Hollywood, I would say. Must well, yeah, because you see all the bizarre sides and and how, um, unless you are absolutely on a supermarket shelf, clearly priced and labeled, it's very confusing. It's very confusing. You need to be, oh, it's that commodity, yeah, it's, oh, it's that one. And with me, it's, oh, oh, um, pass, you know. We, we don't know what to do with him. Of course, the last two years have been enormously different since Barry Levinson, uh, you know, and Bugsy and Phil Robinson in sneakers, um, Ivan Reitman in Dave, uh, Steven Zalian in the last one I've just done, right. and Steven Spielberg, sorry, Steven Zalian in the one you've just seen. That's right, and, searching for Bobby Fischer. And uh, Steven Spielberg in Schindler's List. These are your top five directors, and I've worked with all of them. And all of them have a quality in common. They're absolutely fearless, and they don't need to walk around the supermarket saying, oh, I'll have that label and that label and that label because I know what's in the can. They say, I, I, want to, I want to surprise my audience with a good actor. Look, you need $3 million. If you can come up with $2 million, I can come up with one. Charlie knows nothing about this. This is between you and me. Can you come up with that kind of money? No problem. Would you stop that, please? Would you stop with the no problems? Think for a second. 
What are you going to do to get the money? All your property, your, your house in Scarsdale, the cars, the stocks, the bonds, all belong to Esther and the girls now. Am I correct? Now, there is, in fact, great interest, of course, in Schindler's List because it's going to be Steven Spielberg's, you know, very personal movie, I guess, about the situation in Poland during, during uh, the 1940s. Yes. I guess. Now, the word on the set, I mean, obviously, it's a very, it's a, it's a serious and a, and, a, and a substantial movie. The word on the set from some people I know was that, quote, Gandhi really knows how to party. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> how did you hear that? Ah, uh, you know. I heard about you, what, at the Cafe Ariel? And, yes. Uh, and, you know, a, a, an Italian restaurant, what, named, uh, what was it, Da, da Pietro, I think, if I'm not da mistaken. Da Pietro. That's right. And Palas Pajetov. Is Krakow and, a fun place to hang out? And the Black Gallery? Country? No. No. <laughs> Krakow is a place in which you have to have fun. <laughs> Otherwise, you would go under. <laughs> Krakow is not a fun place. So what do you do to have fun? Well, we, we occasionally used to take over the disco and bring our own tapes. Um, because the Polish rock and roll is not very good. Uh, <laughs> in Poland, there's a uh, bopping like it's not very... <laughs> so we, we, uh, we brought our own tapes in. And uh, we used to take over the whole place and we used to dance until about four in the morning. But when you are doing a, a you know, a tough film, you know, literally on the gates of Auschwitz, you do, you honestly, you really do need to blow all the stuff out and, and hug your mates and, and, and have a great evening. Did you get the sense that this was a very important project for Steven Spielberg? He's, yeah, he's done suburban movies before and now he's definitely. tackling something closer to his heart. Definitely, yes. Uh, wonderful being with an inspired captain. And he was absolutely inspired on that project. His grandparents came from Poland they obviously knew terrible suffering and hardship. It is likely that every living relative of Spielberg's left alive in Poland in 1939 was no longer alive in 1945. That's a hell of a thought. Whether my friend Stephen knew them or not, they've gone. They've gone. That gene bank of Spielberg genius went up the chimney. That's a hell of a thought, and that's one family. And I think that Stephen's rage over this, massive, massive potential, being gutted out of the heart of Europe, and his quest for some kind of opportunity to tell this story, uh, drove him for eight years to make the film. And uh, he was absolutely inspired on the set. He was editing the thing as he went along in the evening, he could see the whole film in his head. He had an absolute unswerving adoration for his actors and for the script. Uh, the film is in black and white. Very daring thing commercially, Very daring. obviously. And I have seen clips of certain of the crowd scenes. And uh, what it's like is it's watching old newsreel footage or documentary footage. The only difference is that you can hear the screams. It's with sound. You can hear the shots and the screams, because in all the other stuff that I've seen, you can't hear anything. Oh, I you see, because there was obviously no, no sound. audio at the They time, had no right. sound, so all you saw were these dreadful, silent images. Now, you have, you have Spielberg's black and white. It's got, he doesn't use, doesn't use a second of documentary footage, but it is all totally, totally believable. And all this time he's editing Jurassic Park, too. All the time he was editing Jurassic Park. He in had Poland, a, right. In Poland, he had a, he had a satellite relay, and, and uh, footage was being relayed by satellite onto his screen at home. He'd do an hour, an hour or two of that, then he'd work on tomorrow. I think he had, was down to four hours sleep a day. But I never saw him sit down on the set other than to eat. I never saw his eyes droop. I never saw him, uh, you know, catnap. He, he was high. He was high on, on, making, on making this wonderful thing. Now, let me, let me ask you about doing Gandhi again, because I know one of the things that Attenborough is famous for is kind of endearments. You know, he calls you darling and yes. all these wonderful... That's probably what he... Is that what he said when he gave you the role? He came into your dressing room or something? And oh, yeah, that's... Uh, yes, he did. I was sitting in my dressing room, and I hadn't done this, the final screen test. But I, I'd done one screen test where I was the young lawyer in South Africa. Um, but I hadn't done the test for the very, very famous silhouette.
you know, the one that everyone knows. And uh, there I was sitting in my diapers, sorry, sitting in my <laughs> robe <laughs> and my sandals mm -hmm. and my bamboo cane, um, rubber bald cap, little bit of hair, specks, moustache, and aging makeup. And I looked at myself in the mirror and I thought, my God, Ben, if you don't do this role, this is the closest you'll ever get to it in your life. Because when I looked in the mirror, I kept my eyes closed during the makeup and opened them to see. I didn't want to see what he was doing. I just wanted to say yes or no to myself when I opened my eyes. I opened my eyes and I said, yes, that's it. You can definitely, you can do it. Now it's, now it's up to them. Mr. Gandhi, I am instructed to request your attendance at an all-government conference in London to discuss the possible independence of India. Richard came in and sat almost as close to me as you are now. And he did something I found very disconcerting, very odd. He came in, he sat down, he collapsed, he collapsed, he collapsed in his chair and I thought, what's the matter? What's gone wrong? Get him a glass of water, please. What's gone wrong? Um, and what I realized later on in my head was that this is a guy who'd been looking for money and an actor for 20 years. And in the movies, sometimes when you get to that stage in your life, in the movies, you jump up and down and go, woo, 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 you know? But in life... Or on the dance floor in Krakow. Yeah. On the dance floor yeah. in Krakow. <laughs> but in life, after a 20-year struggle and a 20-year search, something in the body goes, part of my life has just ended. Just ended. Oh, exhaustion at the top of the mountain. Absolute oh. exhaustion. Then he focused on me and I thought, here comes the bad news. And he said, Ben, I want you to do it. So I stood up and he stood up and we had a good hug. And then he said, well, you better go and do the test now, darling. <laughs> so I, I went off and did it. So I, I was told I had the role before I did the test. So I tested with another actor and I was just as high as a kite and tested with him and he got the role of Nehru and, uh, and off we went. I know we're not ready for my kind of independence. If I'm sent to jail, perhaps that is the best protest our country can make at this time. And if it helps India, I've never refused His Majesty's hospitality. <laughs> so change. It'll open on time. A lot since I first met you. Something that a lot of people noticed in your performance of Bugsy, really, that Meyer Lansky. Yeah. How did you get that gaze? Because it was so different from the, the warm, joy-filled look of Gandhi. Did you, did you use any technical uh, no, means? No, no, I didn't. I didn't. I have, I have very little idea what my eyes are doing. I just know that they're the windows of the soul, and if the soul is in the right place and the mind is in the right place, then, uh, then your eyes will work for you. I, I'm, I try very hard not to act, if you understand what I mean. I try to um, really listen to my fellow actors, know my lines backwards and forwards and inside out, do exactly what the sound man, the cameraman, the director want me to do, uh, do pin all the technical things down, and then, on a really good day, with a following wind and a lot of help, just let go. Just let go. Do not let the audience see you acting. They haven't paid to see you acting. They've paid to see Maya Lansky. They've paid to see Bruce Pandolfini. They've paid to see whoever it is. They've not come to see you show off. They've come to see them. Uh, so I honestly don't know beyond what I've said, uh, you know, if it, if it is anything as conscious as doing something. I, um, in my career, have seemed, seemed to have a growing affinity, and a growing, affinity is not the right word, almost uh, like, a, like a faithful connection with the Jewish community of Europe, of which I'm not a member, and the Holocaust, and pogroms. I did Wiesenthal, I've m most recently done Schindler's List, both were harrowing things to do. But in between Wiesenthal and Schindler's List, I was portraying Maya Lansky, 
It's very interesting. I had a thought whilst filming Schindler's List that uh, Isaac Stern, that I play in Schindler's List, who narrowly misses the gas chamber, and Maya Lansky are two European Jews on opposite sides of the world feeling utterly different experiences. But actually, if you put, if you put, because I'm portraying them both, Maya and Isaac Stern together, the only difference is because I use the same hairpiece for the two characters, that one wears glasses and the other doesn't. But the difference between them is absolutely astonishing. What Maya Lansky did was he left Russia at the turn of the century. He left Russia when the Cossacks were riding into Jewish communities and beating people to death. When they were using their sabers, not only to, to, to knock the, the yarmulke off their head, but to literally cut the top half of the head off. Uh, and I would suspect that Maya, this is all conjecture on my part, backed up by some history from books, that Maya was one in the line, a, a long line of patriarchs who knew how to bribe the Cossacks, the policeman on the corner, the baker, the butcher, the Lord Mayor, the landlord, the rat catcher. Because if the Jew in Europe didn't bribe everybody, he wouldn't stay alive. He would go under. You lived, you're decent, respectable, uh, and, and, and religiously observed life in a sanctuary that was entirely dependent on bribery and corruption. Because if you didn't keep the wolves from the door, they'd get you. Yeah, yeah. Now that, in its, uh, Maya being, being connected to that long line of patriarchs, got onto a boat and got off at New York and probably thought to himself, because he spoke Russian Jewish or Yiddish or whatever, thought to himself, you know, why should it be any different here? So this is a very long-winded answer to your question, Chris. <laughs> but those eyes are the eyes of a, of, of a father and, and an uncle and a patriarch and a governor and a boss of his own family and group and clique saying, it is never going to happen to me again. Then he's a dreamer. Look it. I'm not excusing it. I'm explaining it. I'm a businessman. As far as I'm concerned, anything that broad took, Benny's got to make good on. It's his responsibility. Well, what do you want to do about it, Maya? As a businessman? Give him till Christmas when the hotel opens, see if it works. If it does, we'll all be happy. Let him pay off her debt. And what if the flamingo goes bust? Then I'll handle it myself. It's not a criminal mind you see in the eyes. It's not... It's not somebody who has a hatred of authority. It's someone who desperately wants authority over his own very fragile destiny or the one that he left. I was talking to the guy at my paper who writes the chess column. He told me I could find Bruce Pandolfini here. I'm looking for a teacher for my son. I don't teach anymore. Well, he was sure that you did. I don't. And welcome back. We're here with Ben Kingsley, one of the stars of Searching for Bobby Fischer. Tell us a little bit about this movie and sort of your role in it as, as, as the whole thing works. You're like a chess master with a young charge. I'm a chess master, but I, in a, a particular stage in his career where he has obviously been a championship player. He has clearly been a great chess teacher. But he's removed himself from the game, probably through bitter disappointment in himself. And he literally is a janitor in a chess club, emptying the ashtrays, cleaning out the bathroom, filling in the application forms for the members. He's a man who, having been almost as prominent and as successful as the, the great Bobby Fischer, he's decided to be invisible. He's drawn out of hiding by a remarkable child that is brought into his life by the child's father. Your son creates like Fisher. He sees like him. Inside. You can tell that by watching him play some drunks and a bus. Yes. The relationship between the child and the teacher develops 
ultimately to an extremely loving and trustful one through some very tough moments where I have to tell the boy that in order to win, he has to destroy his opponents. That's the only way to win. You have to have contempt for your opponents because if you don't think it's a part of winning, you're wrong. Trick or treat. You have to hate them. But I don't. They hate you. They hate you, Josh. And it is a dangerous theory, but it's one that I think many protégés have heard from their masters that you have actually to say to yourself, I am the absolute best and no one is as good as me and I have contempt for them. Um, it's something that I went through as an actor many, many years ago uh, when I was in rep. My first job in 65, 66, I would stand in the wings off, off the stage waiting for my entrance and say to myself, I'm better than anyone on stage. I'm better than anyone in this play. I am the best. I am the best. In fact, it doesn't work in acting because acting is not combative, it's collaborative. And once you start saying to yourself, I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best, you will in fact isolate yourself from the joy of <coughs> interacting with your fellow players. Thanks a lot for talking to us, Ben. A Bye. pleasure. Good luck with Schindler and with searching for Bobby Fischer. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching. We'll see you again next time on Later.